My name is Tim Gallaudet. I was an admiral in the U.S. Navy. My specialty was oceanography. And after that, I worked in a U.S. government at a pretty high level. I led an agency called the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. I was an under, I was acting undersecretary and my permanent position was assistant secretary of commerce. And I uh, left that in tw uh, 2021. And now I'm consultant for a variety of ocean weather, climate and environmental technology companies and do some nonprofit work for ocean conservation and veterans. Okay. And with the kind of main highlight of this interview is obviously going to be talking about unidentified aerial phenomena. This is what the US government's been addressing over the past few years, pretty much since 2017 with the New York Times. And I know you've taken an interest in this subject. So I'd like to start with, I suppose, uh, when did you personally take notice or interest in unidentified aerial phenomena or UFOs as it's traditionally called? Yeah, UAPs now is the parlance. And so I've always just been interested in questions about kind of why, you know, where do we come from and, and the nature of those things. And uh, I really got interested in cosmology and astrophysics because I was the superintendent of the U.S. Naval Observatory and uh, a really interesting institution, which has a main function to create catalogs of star positions and their brightnesses. And in working with those astrophysicists, um, I just, I began to really just uh, become fascinated at the scale of our universe. And it, it's incredibly uh, fascinating, large and small scale structure. And of course, then you begin to wonder, is there life out there? Uh, and, uh, and you think about that when you look at that. And then, um, so that's always a question when you're studying such topics. And then it crystallized for me in 2016, I believe, or 2015. I don't really remember the exact date. I had been a one-star admiral at the time in charge of a command with a headquarters in, on the Gulf Coast of Mississippi. And I was in charge of all the Navy meteorology and oceanography professionals that did weather for aircraft carrier flight operations, for example. And uh, I received an email, a classified email on the secret internet that the Navy and the US government uses. And it was from the operations officer of my boss, the US Fleet Forces Command Commander, who was in charge of all the operating forces in the Navy. And it, the title of it was Urgent Safety of Flight. And he sent this email to every subordinate commander under him. These are all the one and two stars who ran Navy operations, or it could be commanders of strike groups, me, I was a shoreside commander. This is a lot of people. I mean, maybe a dozen, two dozen flag officers and admirals like me. And it had a video from the, um, there were two incidents that everybody knows well. There was the 2004 incident of the Nimitz. And then there was an incident off the uh, Norfolk area. And I forgot the strike group involved, but it was, they're very similar where these F-18s were encountering these UAPs. And the videos had the, footage from the F-18s of these objects doing things we could not explain, uh, like go fast one is very famous, that's the one I saw. And, uh, and the ops officer, the two-star, asked us all if we knew anything about this, what was going on, if it was a secret, like a DARPA project, Defense Advanced Research Project Agency, or he just said, if you know anything about this, tell me immediately, because this is becoming a safety of flight issue. We've had several mid-air, potential mid-air collisions or close, nearly minute, and, uh, and I pulled my deputy in, a civilian of the senior executive service, and we both looked at that video and we were like, oh, wow, you know, there, this is something. And we'd always kind of wondered, and now we had this evidence, and it wasn't a joke, we were getting it from our higher headquarters. And the next day, those emails, those videos, they were stripped from our computers. And then, and whatever it was, 2019, 2020, I forgot, they were then released or declassified and, uh, and so that just that just sort of piqued my interest. And that's you, why I've, go ahead. No, no, no. I was just going to say these are the same videos that everyone's now seeing out in the public, the three black and white infrared uh, flare cam videos. Correct. Yeah. Uh, I, I, one of them, I think, is the one I saw. And, and then now, you know, you, I, because of that interest, I've become to know Avi Loeb at the Galileo Project. And with this, I have a PhD in oceanography. I have a scientific mind and I think he's doing the right thing to well, dedicate you're on the team now aren't you you're on the team i am a research affiliate with the galileo project and yes and i think he's doing a great thing to apply scientific discipline to try to understand what these are 
Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Aside from these videos, were you ever exposed to anything during your career, perhaps during your uh, your time as administrator of, uh, of NOAA uh, that you believe to be anomalous, perhaps UFO related or anything underwater that's behaving strangely? Well, no, uh, personally, I have not. Uh, but, you know, they just that was enough for me. No, also seeing what's reported, mm. it's, it's hard to believe how many thousands of reports come out and often involve incredible observers, witnesses, police officers, military personnel. And so that, that's always been in the background for me. And it really just took seeing that video and, and learning about what's happening. The, the, now the Pentagon office is being stood up. Now, just, just this week, NASA dedicating a yep. whole study yep. team to it. And, and it, you know, obviously, people are becoming aware. And I'm, I mean, I wrote an op-ed in The Hill I think you read it, Jay, yep. and, and I talked about the fact that the only reason we haven't been addressing these early is this stigma associated with some of the fringe elements of people who study these phenomena. Yeah, absolutely. Well, the stigma is starting to dissipate. I think the problem uh, with this uh, with this issue is that there is a surface level of knowledge that I think is relatively acceptable. Like, you know, we have there are these advanced platforms that are behaving in ways we can't really explain and it could potentially be something very interesting. I think that's that's the kind of surface level blueprint that people are being given in the public. But I mean, I think a lot of people, I mean, I would say I would I would hasten to guess that there are some elements of the government and the private industry that know, uh, you know, a, a quite a sophisticated level of knowledge on this issue. But even within the UFO research community, uh, you know, there are there are those of us who have been looking into this for quite some time, some people decades. And there is a lot to unpack with this subject you know it's maybe not so simple as just these objects flying around in the sky and there is a lot to try and address and so I, I I wonder where the US government's going to try and take this as they progress through this obviously with the Senate and Congress getting involved it's it's still a very basic discussion and I think that a lot of us know and perhaps you yourself know that this subject is actually quite a quite a large nexus of phenomena you know well, oh, right. I've, I've listened to many of your episodes and, uh, and that, that Thank when you. you look at that, it's great what you do. Uh, there's a greater awareness people are becoming um, to, I, I think, possess. And, uh, and that's good that you're fostering that. And you're right. I, I don't have, a, in fact, my faith in the government arriving sooner than anyone else is, is pretty low. Mm -hmm. Not that I, I don't believe in the U.S. government. I was a part of it for 36 years, but uh, government moves slow. There are there are many stove pipes and red tape as they call that and uh and if you just look at like what, what the dod office is doing i wouldn't first of all they're, they're probably not going to share any of their data because most of the data they have is classified and then with nasa uh, i think it's going to be the same way and that's why avi wrote it avi Loeb of the galileo project wrote a kind of a <laughs> yeah i saw a, that <laughs> a lively uh, he really his articles are terrific uh he he i think the title of it was um Imitation oh, okay. is the sincerest form of flattery, I believe, was the that, maybe the title. Yeah, <laughs> that absolutely was it. And he talked about NASA basically finally getting on board because he had been doing this for a year, mm -hmm. and and they wouldn't bring him on board because they would. They said it would be a conflict of interest, and yeah. I don't want to go into that. But that ultimately, the government is just moved slow. And in fact, interesting, what I'm doing in my main job now as a consultant is uh, I'm, I've embraced all these great commercial tech companies who are really getting it. Just like some of your uh, your kind of, I think, very open minded um, uh, or guests that you've had on, they also are moving faster than our typically sluggish government, um, and and that's that's really why I want to be on your show. Is I think I think uh, they're not going to come to the answer quicker than maybe others like the Galileo Project, and that's that's why I'm enjoying being on it. And not to blame anything, that, there's reasons for the government being slow, and it's usually wrapped around a lot of laws passed by Congress. Yeah, uh, to use taxpayer dollars with with good stewardship. Yeah, no, I agree. I think obviously the bureaucratic pace of government is what it is. You know, that's just the way that this uh, this system works. But at the same time, I think that the you know the congressional interest and Senate interest and the fact that we've had the hearing recently, it's all just serving as a, a way of providing a, a blueprint for people to find this an acceptable thing to be interested in. And then obviously the scientific and academic engagement that's coming off of the back of that, like the Galileo Project and UAPX and a few other different endeavors. Um, I like you place a lot more faith in uh, civilian initiatives and efforts than I do in uh, in government programs or or any sort of uh, disclosure process what did you think of the uh, of the hearings because 
uh, you know, a, a lot of us weren't exactly surprised at the lack of satisfactory answers from these two officials. What were your thoughts on the uh, on the on the hearing? I, I agree with you, Jay. This this was very it was very perfunctory. Congress said do it, and they did it, and that's it. You know, there, there's there's so much there there. I'm sure. And I've testified in front of Congress, and I know exactly what was going through their heads. They they had you know they had the answer to other people in the Department of Defense, and uh, and they had to kind of stick to a script really. Uh, and, and there's reasons for that. And because the department is very, the Department of Defense in this case, very slow to go out and, and it make policy. And whenever you testify on the Hill for a department, a cabinet level uh, office, you have to really stay to the script because you, it's not your job to make policy. It's your job to follow it. And, 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 yeah. and they, they've not really, they've not wanted to get ahead of this and really be, be wide ranging or thinking. Um, they're still trying to figure out, I think, what they want to do. And, and it's just because the Department of Defense is so unwieldy. Um, so that's, again, going back, let's, let's get some scientists and others, to, to, like you mentioned, NGOs to uh, companies, media companies to go after this and maybe get a better answer sooner. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. You know, one issue that was brought up in the hearing that caught many within the UFO research community by, uh, by surprise was the it was the mentioning of uh, of what are known as the Admiral Wilson documents or the Eric Davis notes. Are you familiar with those documents? Just vaguely, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, this this is something that I didn't really expect to to have pop up. And although the two officials did basically deny uh, deny having any knowledge of of what they uh, what they were about, the fact that that was brought up and is now actually on Congress.gov, the website. There's a PDF of the documents on the website, which is literally a discussion apparently between a DOD astrophysicist and a former director of the DIA who's telling this physicist that he was denied access to UFO reverse engineering programs and that he looked into the, the black budget indexes of the Pentagon and found these sub programs and compartments and eventually was, uh, you know, allowed a meeting with these three representatives of a program, uh, an unacknowledged special access program, uh, waived or carved out. And, um, he, uh, was basically given a little introductory hello and told, you're not going to get any access. And the fact that that was actually brought up in, in the hearing and is actually on congress.gov is quite interesting. And I think that that probably signifies that there is quite a few people within the Congress who are aware of this document. Eric Davis is quite a, a vocal individual. He's, he's, he's now a bit more quiet because he works for Aerospace Corporation, but he's, he's spoken to Leslie Kane from the New York Times and uh, other individuals. So it's interesting that they brought that up. Oh, it's very interesting. I know the Aerospace Corporation well, mm. and I, here's what I know in my perspective. Okay, I, I was in the government for 32 years, most of it in defense, have been read into black programs. And when and the way nature of those are that only a small number of people for security reasons are, are able to have access and knowledge of those programs. And it's very tightly controlled mm. for great reason. But then it results in the things you just mentioned senior people like the secretary of defense himself not knowing what's going on in his department and it's it creates a, a very interesting situation when you when you think about it that only a small cobble if you will of people yeah. in the dod have access to certain things like this now uh, for the record i i've not been read into any uap related programs and um so i don't know i cannot say there are any or there aren't uh, but you can sort of guess you know when you, you have a uh, disclosures like this and no know, knowing of what we can see as a department of defense <laughs> it doesn't take you know hard to put two plus two together uh, to know that that there might it, they exist and they may exist i mean what do you think do you do you think that the u.s government has materials maybe even technological that aren't human well again i don't know jay but but I have a hard what, time what believing your gut they don't. You? Yeah, what does your gut tell say, you? <laughs> I have a hard time believing they don't because I, I know what they have been able to collect in, in terms of just the nature of our adversaries. And that's uh, it, it just, and then if there are thousands of very credible reports out there and we have the most, our US military has the most sophisticated collection systems on the planet. <laughs> you, yeah, it doesn't, it's not a stretch. It's not a stretch at all. Yeah, would, would you say that this would be a cover-up since around the Roswell time? Well, that, that's a, you know, everyone wants to say that it was a cover-up. You know, again, I, I, my experience is probably that you have compartmented programs that have the information 
and and their job is to protect the information that and the nature of it is this it's very interesting so these are things that i just know and people maybe don't see or understand so that that's all there that's the kind of the role of the department to protect their information and their capabilities not disclose sources and methods and i include the intelligence community in this but then when but when not happy congress gets involved <laughs> that's why they passed these these on the in the national defense authorization act that's why the direction was um, by jill Brown was issued to stand up the office and start reporting on the science and scientific nature of, of these phenomena because uh, they realized uh, they weren't getting what they wanted and uh, and it's just it's a weird dynamic this happened to me at NOAA, but not with not with uaps in that uh, Congress passing legislation because they wanted to see us do a better job, whether it be hurricane research or what have you. And so that that is just the dynamic. And it's great because I don't think it would ever happen naturally or organically in the Department of Defense. Do you think that do you think that there's any chance that this could be uh, like foreign adversarial technology or are you kind of quite convinced that this is something a, a bit stranger than a prosaic explanation? That's a great question. Uh, and I again, from what I know, uh, I don't, we would, um, I don't think it's a foreign uh, capability. I don't think it's a terrestrial in nature. I, I think um, there are reasons for that because I've been read into things of adversary capabilities. And um, I, 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 first of all, if our adversary had capabilities like this, there's a very good chance that we would have them too. That's the way these things work, counterintelligence and whatnot. Um, and, and it wouldn't be so, I, I just don't know of any instances where we have been so caught off guard like this. I have a hard time believing it. And, um, but, you know, it's not impossible. I just think it's not likely. Mm. I want to I run a, a kind of scenario past you because this was something that was suggested to me by, uh, well, someone who got in contact with me a couple of years ago claiming to be a GS-15 rank intelligence officer within the NSA. And there's a few people that have been connected to this individual since I got in contact with them. And um, we're all <clears throat> a little bit on the fence of whether or not this is a legitimate source or not, but he's certainly quite a interesting and impressive individual. And um, basically like the, the scenario, let's say that a program exists within the world of black projects uh, within which they've been exploiting a beyond next generation platform that was recovered many years ago and is believed to be non-human in origin. And they have over the course of decades managed to create a platform that at least to some degree mimics this very advanced non-human technology and is utilizing a breakthrough energy and propulsion system, very disruptive thing that's not been witnessed before. Now, let's say during the process of creating this beyond next generation platform based off of the exploitation of some non-human technology, they get to a phase in the technological readiness test where this platform is ready to be tested in a mock operational environment. Obviously, you'd want to see how this hyper advanced technology would respond to your most advanced surface world uh, offensive and, and defensive forces and vice versa. So what they decide to do is drop this disruptive asset into the middle of a series of naval war games or training scenarios and in doing so they have absolute control over the environmental parameters no armaments will be utilized by the carrier strike group no risk of a live fire on your disruptive asset but you do get the opportunity to gauge the response time and overall capability of your most advanced military forces when they're faced with a breakthrough technology that exceeds their performance capabilities completely and this might be an important test to perform if, for example, you know that your enemies are doing the same thing when you know that countries like Russia or China are also exploiting these advanced technologies that they've recovered. So it might become necessary to know how your surface world military forces would respond to a highly advanced threat. And then when you take into account, and I think it was the Roosevelt, maybe the one that you were forgetting the name yeah, of, the USS Roosevelt, there was a, a couple of high ranking non-uniformed officers who came on board the USS Roosevelt during that UAP event. And they confiscated the radar bricks before promptly leaving. And it makes me wonder if, and this is what this person suggested, that the Roosevelt and Nimitz events were in fact a series of technological readiness tests for the purposes of understanding how we would respond to a beyond next generation platform. And, and perhaps we have a good reason to be concerned that such a platform might be used against us. But you've obviously said that you feel that you've been given enough intelligence to suggest that these kind of propulsion methods are not being used by our enemies. But what do you think of the overall idea of that scenario? Is it plausible? Is it something that they would maybe do? Or is that a bit too outrageous? I think it's, it's, it's plausible, Jay. Th th that world uh, of NSA and um, uh, 
intelligence, counterintelligence, these black programs, mm. they, they're weird. And, and they, they <laughs> that stuff like this, I would say, well, in general, um, it would surprise you. Okay. That's, that's, so I would say it's possible. I think it's also, again, highly unlikely just based on what I know in this particular situation with the Roosevelt, because, you know, I, I've been part of the, the military system. I, I met with secretaries of defense and chiefs of naval operations. And, you know, I kind of, and I know how it works. I, in fact, a very good friend of mine was an undersecretary of defense, of defense for intelligence uh, in the last administration. And, you know, you, very plausible, I guess, um, scenarios exist where we'd want to test, let's say we have the technology, where you want to test it against conventional forces, but we would never do it to where we may potentially endangered those forces and create these sort of conflicts and blue on blue or whatever it is, like in a, in a, in, in this exercise, comp two X, there's just, there'd be so many opportunities for things to go wrong and kill sailors. That it would never, it would never be. I just can't see that happening. It'd be like you know the, you'd have CIA going totally counter rogue to the DoD, and the DoD owns DIA, and so it's just like I, I can't imagine them getting in there with without without approval at the at the DNI level, the Director of National Intelligence. Okay, mm. there, the, I can't see the DNI saying, okay, we're going to allow lower level offices to to, to basically put the safety of sailors and pilots at risk for uh, to do some demonstration. We can do all of that in classified training ranges. We don't need to do that ever yeah, out in, un, in, a, in a totally open airspace in the U.S. exclusive economic zone that our adversaries actually have access to and could, and can, and could sur surveil, right? In fact, there's another reason why you'd never do it because then, then our adversaries who, like Russia did this all the time, you know, with their fishing trawlers out there with tons of SIGINT and ELINT collecting on our, our naval exercises, that the remote possibility that a foreign adversary could be collecting on a high, on technology like that would just rule out immediately, uh, other than in addition to safety of flight of our sailors and pilots, um, that kind of a, an instance of ever happening. Stuff happens like that, you know, again, in classified training ranges that are controlled and they're instrumented so that we know exactly what's going on uh, just that just doesn't happen in my experience, but I wouldn't rule it out a hundred percent because I'm not. I was not a part of the ICE. I was really remotely part of the intelligence community. I was in naval intelligence, if you will. Oceanography and intelligence are in the same community, mm. but not. I was never like doing. And I have friends in the NSA, but that just sounds. I, I, I'd like to meet this person. <laughs> That's all I got to say. Um, I, maybe maybe it happened, but I just so doubt it. All right. Well, uh, Holden, if you're listening, I'll put you in touch with Tim and we'll uh, <laughs> we'll see how you guys get on. Oh, yeah. Tell me about it. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Uh, no, I, 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 I definitely see your point there. What do you have any ideas about what they might be doing lurking around these training ranges, buzzing naval ships? I mean, do you think that this is reconnaissance on our military offensive capabilities? My thoughts on this, Jay, are that, um, I mean, we're moving out as a nation, uh, as a society, and uh, really advancing drone technology. It's just everywhere. I, I led programs in the Navy and at NOAA to use drones for environmental surveillance, uh, whether oceanography, meteorology, you name it. And just, th just fast forward that technology a decade to a century. Uh, no reason to believe whoever is the agent here, ag agency controlling these things, that that technology exist today and it's just a much more advanced state uh and that, that that's probably just one possibility but i i like avi Loeb's perspective on the on this phenomenon in a general way we've only been on this planet for a small sliver of the universe's existence and we have devices that are now we hold in our hand and every bit of information ever collected in the history of the universe really is accessible by these small little devices what are we going to be like in a hundred years or a million years and a million years still is a small little window based on the whole existence of the universe. So Avi likes to talk about, you know, there's probably other civilizations all around and they have probably, maybe they've evolved and they've decayed and there just might be remnant technology all around or they're or it's active and they're actually, they're actually exploring like we did in, in the, you know, the, the age of sail and the, the great period of exploration with Columbus and whatnot. Why not? kids think that that would be happening. I just, it, to me, it's so narrow-minded to think the universe doesn't, isn't teeming with life. And now, and we're being observed by countless 
other civilizations that are smart enough not to interact with us <laughs> because yeah. they know it wouldn't go well. Yeah, we might think we're so sophisticated, but really we're just monkeys throwing missiles around. So uh, I'm sure we're viewed with uh, quite a bit of caution from any sort of cosmic neighbors. Absolutely, absolutely do. Yeah, <laughs> I agree. But I uh, no, I agree with you. I think that it's uh, it's likely teeming with life, and uh, I think the consensus amongst a lot of the scientists who actually look at this properly uh, imagine that the most successful life would be artificial intelligence to some degree and that uh, you know the the first contact scenario between human beings and some form of alien life would likely be uh, a form of AI that can obviously exist in the vacuum of space for centuries if needs be um, maybe a self-replicating uh, machine of, of I think they called von Neumann probes or something like that um, mm. you know these these are interesting ideas and uh, I, I think that we are really I really do think we're on the precipice of, uh, of of some major breakthroughs and discoveries within the next decade with with this type of subject. I think we're just on that edge. Our scientific sophistication is getting to a point where our mod our models for reality are starting to be disrupted quite heavily in a lot of different ways. And I think that our scientific interpretations of of what reality really is and and how reality works are going to be challenged quite significantly within the next 10, 15, 20 years. Like I can't even imagine what 50 years into the future is going to be like. So um it's an interesting time to be alive, man. Uh, amen. You're right. It, it, it's actually it's exciting too. And I like the way Avi has put it. He calls his project the Galileo project, mm. you know, hearkening back to Galileo himself, who broke a paradigm with this um, Earth-centric to heliocentric system. And we are in the verge of potentially, again, uh, discovering a whole new paradigm, which is, and which I'm should not surprise any of us. Yeah, it shouldn't surprise any of us. Would you would you be happy to talk about your own family's experiences with so-called paranormal phenomena? Because this was something that you mentioned to me, and it certainly feels like it probably played a role in opening you up to some larger concepts about the nature of uh, reality and the nature of what we call the paranormal. Is this is this something you'd be comfortable speaking about? I would. I would absolutely like to do that. So here, I'll share it with you. And and you know, so like this is a weird thing, by the way, or interesting thing, and I'm st we're still kind of trying to understand it as we all are. You know, because this you see a sort of grouping of UAP and paranormal and where, how does it intersect? And the answer is, I don't know. But I have I have my one set of experiences from the Navy and observing the videos from the Navy pilots and working with Avi and, and just thinking about that deeply. And then, of course, on this other aspect of it, uh, my family's experience. Now, we were all grown up in traditional kind of religion. Uh, with, I think, my myself as an Episcopalian and my wife maybe raised the same. Um, she, Catholicism influenced her a bit too, but ultimately uh, not strict, uh, but that was just sort of the background. And then, uh, but when, at, at some point in our lives, uh, my youngest daughter had uh, real serious behavioral issues. And to put it, just sum it all up, um, she is like many of these medium that, that you see. She can see spirits. She saw them all the time. And a lot of listeners might just think this is just a joke or, you know, made up. Uh, you can do some homework here. And there are people that have this ability to tap into whatever we want to call it, the other side, where people go when they die, whatever that is, the energy that people leave behind. Uh, there's a lot of ways to explain it, but it was real. And real to us. I mean, she had real experiences. It was affecting her. And we, through a lot of therapy, we were able to basically have her, now she's 13. Um, she became adjusted and uh, has, has kind of dealt with that. She sort of suppressed it actually, which is okay. I mean, she's only 13. We don't, we, we can take a pause and help her develop as a person and human before becoming, coming to grips with that incredible ability. And, you know, my wife and I, we, um, through this experience to just be able to help her. Uh, we came to meet several mediums who are incredibly gifted. You know, there's, there's one it's on TV, Long Island medium, Teresa Caputo. Uh, again, listeners, listeners may think that's just a joke. Uh, that woman has real ability. I went to one of her shows in Baltimore, uh, not even a month ago. And it was incredible how she can tap into real people and their experiences. Again, you know, I, I have, many people will dismiss this discussion right now, uh, but it's sort of like uh, a lot of people say about UFOs. I know what I saw. Well, that. And, Don't worry, and, you're in you're in safe hands with the majority of my audience. <laughs> oh, right, I've listened, but uh, but but so and, and and 
let me share with you a few examples. So one of our friends is a medium and we kind of, we have readings with her because she's just very gifted. And, and she's, I'll just share, this is just my story, right? Yeah, uh, yeah. Well, we were wondering, most we, we encountered her to help my youngest daughter. And then she'd read us every now and then. And I, I remember we were talking about our future at a certain point a couple of years ago. And I was a, I don't remember if I was, a, I was a captain. No, I was a captain in the Navy and I was in charge of the Naval Observatory. And the Naval Observatory makes those star catalogs they talked about. It also is the the DOD or the National Precise Time Reference. So GPS has very precise clocks and the reference for it is at the Naval Observatory and it's created by a system of 100 atomic clocks. A lot of technical stuff. I sat down with her. She had no idea what my job was. And she just looked at me and said, all I see are clocks everywhere. I don't know what this means. And, you know, and I don't know if you've ever been read by anybody, Jay, that has a gift like this. But you, this is something no one can guess. You know, the, the technical nature of my job, no one knew. Um, and she didn't even know. Uh, but that was one thing. And it made me just kind of go, wow. And then, then she had a, a kind of a, I guess, a prediction. And she said, you know, uh, I don't know what this means, Tim, but because um, we were sure if I would promote to, to Admiral okay, at that time. And she goes, I see five stars over your head. <laughs> and we're like, what is that? I, I was like, there's no possibility for, there's not even a five-star admiral in the Navy, you know, it's now four-star, used to be five-star in the, in World War II. And, uh, but ultimately we just, that, that was symbolic for something we couldn't guess. Well, afterwards in time, I made one star, but then I left the Navy and became an assistant secretary. And for a period, I was an acting undersecretary. And that position is higher than the chief of Naval Operations. And that is un, that is so unpredictable. And for her to have seen that, we look at that still and go, wow. I mean, we yeah, didn't see it coming. Yeah. And so th there's these people that can see things. And, you know, on your, I, I listen to your shows. And, and, she, and, and that helped us my, with my daughter. A really interesting example was, you know, when she was really having a lot of these experiences, we had this like little camera, basically a video recorder. And we were in her room one time when things were happening. And we just filmed it, uh, I think. And when we looked at the tape again, as people have seen in these experiences, there were just orbs flying all around this video. I mean, seriously, many, and it was so, it was so active. And these are all things that um, you know, we just couldn't believe ourselves. And what, and my wife and I went on a journey, you know, we were raised in very traditional religious households and these experiences, and it was out of love, by the way, that was it. We loved our daughter and we wanted help to help her. And so through just meeting people, doing a lot of reading about people, these experiences, it, we, it, it became real to us and it opened our minds. And I don't have all the answers, but I know what we experienced. I know what she saw. And it was even in the show I shared with you. It's called Dead Files. Uh, we had uh, um, Amy, I forgot her last name, but she's uh, she came on and did a show with my daughter called uh, You Will Be Mine. And our, our listeners can, can look for that. And, uh, and that, that just profiled her experience at a time when it was pretty, and again, we put, we contacted them because we thought she could help her. And, and she ultimately did help my daughter. That's absolutely fascinating. And have you, have, has anyone else in your family, do you know of any kind of history in your family of people having certain sensitivities or is this kind of the first time this has popped up? Well, we, we, we do know of that. I would say my father's side of the family and um, potentially my wife's uh, too. Again, oh, in, wow. in, yeah, yeah. It's interesting how, and I've seen this happen to others who have a gift. It, there's, there's sort of a family history. And um, so, yes, uh, I'll just, I don't have details. I'm, I'm, I'm low on details because, you know, those generations didn't talk about these things a lot. It's just only been recently that my, my father has talked about this. But, uh, but yeah, um, and, and, but, it was, but to the level, I guess, and maybe like just like the UAP phenomena, we, there's so much more awareness and openness now. Yeah. Um, and, you know, it's like she was not the devil. You know, she was she was seeing real things. And that's it. We were we are not going to brand her or, or blame her. And I think it was, and I ultimately know that it was that love that we shared, my wife and I, for her, that helped open our minds and create the right outcome uh, of her being well-adjusted, having that in our history, not being afraid of it or ashamed of it, and, um, and being aware and open now to a lot of other things that happen in life uh, and maybe, maybe uh, seeing their meaning. Mm. No, I... I... I resonate with this because I'm, I mean, I'm of the opinion. I mean, you've watched, you've watched a few of my 
shows so i'm sure you you know my thoughts on on consciousness and and the human uh the human experience but i i kind of just think that the human body is like a like a highly tuned waveguide and that we could almost be seen like a like a biological quantum computer a, a node on a network and that the uh, the electromagnetic energy and other fundamental forces of the universe kind of represent almost a, a cosmic network that we're all connected to and that our body mind brain interface can kind of act like a like a technology like a sender and a receiver and that we can move our consciousness through this network but that we have just kind of lost touch with these innate abilities that maybe some of our more shamanistic ancestors understood to a higher degree of sophistication and we've kind of lost touch with this with the age of enlightenment and material reductionism and separating ourselves from spirit um but i think that we're maybe creeping back to this it's it's something that I, I've, I don't know if I've coined this term because I don't know if you've ever heard of Terence McKenna, but I listened to an unhealthy amount of Terence McKenna. And uh, so maybe maybe this is his philosophy leaking in. But um, I, I kind of look at the way that we've been progressing through history. We, we started off as very shamanistic, paganistic, tribalistic, psychedelic taking, uh, you know, small communities. We've now grown into this global uh, hyper connected uh, community of people where science is the leading edge not spirit and maybe now and it, you, you're starting you're starting to see it through developments in quantum mechanics developments in artificial intelligence and then obviously on the other side of that there's this kind of rise in things like psychedelic uh, research and consciousness research it kind of feels like we're going into techno shamanism like spirit science and that there's this melding between these two what were once polarizing observatory lenses of reality, they're kind of coming together under this banner because science is getting to this point where it can actually start to explain some of the more esoteric teachings that have been given to us for uh, you know, thousands of years by monks on hilltops talking about life. And now when you listen to a quantum physicist on a presentation, it almost sounds a little bit like a spiritual talk. They're saying the electrons in my body are the same as the electrons in yours and everything in between us is connected through entanglement on the quantum level. It's like, you're basically just saying what spiritual teachers have been saying, but you're saying it with more complex language. You know, Jay, I couldn't agree more. And I, it's there's a lot to unpack there, of course, but I, I would say that, you know, look at uh, Einstein's E equals MC squared. Energy and mass are equivalent. So if you ponder that, uh, then there's no reason to think that spirit, that energy, that massless energy and, and our existence, th there's that, there is a, a connection and we're an equivalence. And I think I, I, I firmly believe that we are, and I, I don't believe that like science and religion or science and spirit are separate. Project unity. I think, I think there's a unification there that we are, you know, every day we're sort of uncovering and, uh, and that's why it is exciting. And I don't know what it is, but I, Things like you said about your body being a, or your mind brain being a like a transceiver to to energy and i i know it to be true <laughs> you know that we i i we have got like cedar my daughter she's got messages it's just like that there is something going on there um and i i think you're right about that and 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 you and like uh, as you mentioned there's just interesting phenomena like how do butter monarch butterflies as they migrate to mexico and back over successive generations, know how to do that. Those tiny little brains, what is going on there? You know, and I mean, that, that's, that's a sort of a tangent, but not really. What I'm saying is there's so much we don't know and we're starting to uncover that can't be explained directly by, I think, our current laws of physics and current knowledge of the physical world as we know now. Uh, and so it's a really, it's exciting to see every day and, you know, the explain quantum entanglement like that action, um, action at a distance or whatever uh, Einstein coined it. Um, what was it? Uh, spooky. Spook, spooky, spooky action at a distance. Yeah, that was it. Yeah. You know, that that's, but it's real. <laughs> In fact, it's, it's so real. much of our technology today is, is, is based on quantum principles. And now mm -hmm. we're moving into quantum computing and quantum communications. And one of my companies has quantum sensors so works that stuff is we're using it's, it it's <laughs> getting there it's getting there yeah. we, we are getting to this critical mass point i think uh where there is going to be a, a bit of a paradigm shift and uh it's exciting it is exciting i i, I yes I, I and i i thought you know being on your show thank you for having me i just wanted to say that i wanted it i guess i wanted to be on your show because here i was fairly senior in the u.s government from a military background primarily and you know i think i just wanted to be a symbol of that that a, awakening that 
increasing awareness is okay yeah. and acceptable and I, I like i'm seeing it move outside of, of being a fringe to potentially more mainstream yeah and um as your one guest uh, i think it was was it ryan ellis he talked oh, about this ryan great bledsoe. deception ryan bledsoe ryan bledsoe that was yeah. it yeah that was a really good episode yeah. I, I i'm not going to repeat everything he said but i'll just say i see a lot of things like he does and you yeah yeah oh well i really appreciate that and i think that you and i need to maybe secure a time where we can talk for even longer because we could probably go quite deep into the consciousness and awareness side of this thing and i'd love to uh you know i'd love to talk to you for a little bit longer on those on those types of topics yeah i will thank you i would let's we i'd be happy to come back because yeah. I, I as i've thought about with my daughter uh the world's religions <clears throat> unify i think when it comes to that human consciousness and or spirit and um and what is that it's uh it, it, there's some interesting and you probably have seen the research going into that now and as has been in the past and I, it's it's funny there's a really good book out there called <clears throat> two books called um uh sapiens is the first book do you know it i've got it i think somewhere around here it's a good book about mm -hmm. people and, and all our history and the the sequel was homo deus if you've mm. read that i haven't got that one i don't think so you'll like this because the sequel is goes from more of the the sort of biology and anthropology of people to the future where there's a more technology ai bioengineering component and the okay. title homo homo deus like the prequel sapiens homo sapiens it implies that with modern medicine technology etc we will become almost godlike Point being is it's a really great treatment, those two books by Yuval Harari, the Israeli author, about people in their evolution. Oh, yeah, this guy, this guy. Yeah. And then the sequel about our future with technology. But there's one thing he does not address and leaves as a question mark in his book, and it's consciousness. Mm. And I, I'd love to see that guy or somebody take, take write that third series about consciousness and in the same level of academic uh, rigor and intellect that he applied to the first two yeah this is uh i mean this is something that people are discussing on on again a bit of a, a polarizing uh distinct camps on the debate because yeah there's this there's this whole concept of we might be transcending into a kind of utopian techno shamanistic society and and it's all very <laughs> exciting but then obviously we look at the, the the current power structures of our world and the level of corruption that seeped into a lot of these you know global infrastructures and uh, people are worried that actually it could turn into a, a dystopia with artificial surveillance and you know uh, heavy monitoring of civilians and what do you think are you are you are you optimistic overall because i'm i i feel like overall i'm actually optimistic i feel like in the short term there might be a little bit more turbulence to iron out and the human species is kind of going through a bit of a growing period right now so i i kind of feel like there's a little bit more shit to hit the fan but in the long run i kind of have hope the same way uh you know things are pretty bad right now with russia and ukraine and a lot of other things going on but um I, I do have hope. It's my nature. Maybe it's it's uh, <clears throat> ill-founded, but I'm optimistic in general. And I've seen our species do some amazing things uh, for good. In fact, every this is an interesting thing about human nature uh, at, at writ large, not with every individual. But whenever there's bad, uh, people turn it into good. You look at these these school shootings. You look at I've seen I've known numerous veterans who had terrible experiences, and they've all founded nonprofits to help others and. I just it's it's sort of, it's actually a really encouraging thing about the human spirit. It always happens. Most people turn bad into good. They learn from it. They grow stronger. Uh, there are uh, there are exceptions, but uh, I, I see that more than I don't see it. I have a personal experience. I lost my house in Hurricane Katrina. We were on the Gulf Coast and we lost all our whole neighborhood was washed away in twenty eight feet of storm surge. Jeez. I mean, it, well, yeah, and th thankfully we were okay. We evacuated and all that you know helps me become a more empathetic person especially with people who go through these tragedies of lo losing their homes and su such are family members thankfully none of my family members were hurt but others were and uh and, and i saw so much good people my wife we had nothing and you know, she evacuated to baltimore i slept in my office down on the gulf coast in the, my navy office for a couple months and or a couple weeks and she went to baltimore and there were People were just donating things. There were warehouses she visited full of good pe goods people donated to Katrina victims. 
and that's just our example. I, I, I you know, there's you see this all around, and I mean, I, I won't talk on individual specifics, but uh, like it's the like the wounded warriors I see from uh, in the U.S. military. All of them have, have turned their trials into triumphs. There's a really uh, really in inspiring individual named uh, Jason Redmond, and he's a Navy SEAL officer who was um, caught in an ambush and had basically half his face blown off, uh, taking machine gun fire. And, um, and now he's a motivational speaker and he's written a book and it's a powerful story, Jason Redmond, as one of many examples, because I work with the Navy SEALs, so I cite that example as uh, examples of people turning bad into good. And I, so your long view, uh, your, your long view is, Jay, is something I, I think uh, I have hope for. This is this is the thing about life, isn't it? On an individual level, on a collective level, uh, you can't have up without down, dark without light, you know, hot without cold. And so all all situations lead into the next situation leads into the next situation and so i think that when you're having i guess you know at least in my own life and obviously you've observed this in your life when you are having those moments of turbulence or darkness or pain or suffering or sorrow um it's very difficult uh, during the the time to to recognize what might be happening that's significant uh, during that process but when you reflect back on it usually um that's when you can notice how this has actually led towards where you are now uh, and you're in a better place or you've learned an important lesson and uh, i think that the, the key that maybe the secret is to to realize that enough so that when the next time something turbulent comes around because inevitably it will life will always hand you an, another thing to deal with you can deal with it a little bit better and so maybe right now with the the way that things are going i mean we've had the pandemic we've got russia ukraine the you know the economy political divisions just so much is going on it makes me think, well, if this was my personal life, I'm probably learning a really important lesson right now with this. I just maybe don't recognize what it is, but upon reflection, hopefully I'll see why this is happening. And I think that that's why I have long term optimism, because I just think that this is all this is all us just kind of ironing the creases out and growing up as a species. You know, I firmly agree. I, you know, I thought about this deeply, I think. And, and so many religions, they, they characterize this uh, journey we're all on in a very similar way that, that these hard experiences refine your soul. And, and I, I just know this to be true. And I think, you know, so many people have trouble with the bad things that happen in life. And, and granted, I, I have not suffered like others. I, I'm just probably not strong enough. And that's why I never had those challenges. But I do, I do see that happening, that people take and use those to become better. And you know, and this this sort of aligns with the many people think that, that that's what reincarnation is all about, and I, I don't dismiss that um, at all. In fact, but, but, but Christianity embraces this fully as well. And so it's most of the world's religions, and that's I think a beautiful thing is that that I think human understanding and is is embraced this to some degree. And I think the more that we get on board, and the more people in humanity, you know, the, be the better off we'll be. Well, I think that you're certainly trying to do your best to contribute to, uh, you know, raising the consciousness level. I really love the fact that you wanted to come on to here to basically be like, look, I am a retired U.S. Navy Rear Admiral, uh, but I think that you can still be all into trying to raise awareness and consciousness and, and bring that vibe and, and look at things in reality in a different way. And I think that, you know, people who have had careers like yourself and are very respectable in their fields, it's important that people realize, oh, actually, no, I can be a serious person and do a serious job and, and do good at my job and also have philosophical ideas about reality because why why can't we we are as human beings we are dreamers and creators and thinkers so like we should celebrate that and i think that we're in that process now of going actually it's it's okay to think about ufos or the paranormal or different dimensions intersecting with our own these are all things that are now starting to become a little bit more reasonable to speak about we're just at the beginning stages with the ufo issue but I have hope. I think that we're, we're starting to open up. I do too, Jay. And, and I, I do believe we're all connected. Uh, you, you feel it, you, you experience it uh, every day in many ways. And, uh, and that's is my main job in the government was leading and being a senior officer, being a leader and, and, no, and being just mindful of those connections made me a much better leader and, and, and vice versa. Um, that awareness or, or my leadership helped me gain greater awareness about those connections. So um, it's uh, yeah. So thank you. I mean, I appreciate you having me on and I'm looking forward to our next, next version <laughs> and our next iteration. Uh, and thank you for what you do. 
Absolutely. Thank you so much. And uh, I really appreciate that you're a, you're a fan of the, of the podcast as well. That's, uh, that's put a good smile on my face. And I do have to quickly apologize to my Patreons because a bunch of them sent in questions. You, we're going to have to do a 2.0, my man, because we're going to have to get you back on. And there's, there's listener questions. People are asking all sorts. So uh, maybe, maybe we, can, uh, we can schedule something when you've, when you've got more time. Sounds good, Jay. Uh, yeah, I will do that. I'd love to answer some questions next next round. And uh, I, I'm, I'm going to talk Egypt. I'm heading to Paris and Greece after that. So maybe we'll come back and talk about maybe what we, I learned there. And uh, wonderful. Thank you. Oh, sounds awesome, man. Well, you've got a great vibe to you. I think you've, you've got an awesome energy. And uh, I look forward to speaking to you soon.